Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's DCRI Research Conference. It's a real pleasure to have Larry Jackson here. For many clinicians, making decisions about treatment benefits for their patients can be difficult. As we all look to the literature to guide us, sometimes our patients don't match the patients that were in those trials. And today, we're going to hear about how this particularly applies to underrepresented minorities, um, particularly in um, the area of interest for Dr. Jackson, who uh, is a second year EP fellow, second year research fellow here at the DCRI after joining Duke back in residency and doing his cardiovascular uh, fellowship um, first few years here at Duke. Um, his areas of interest are in understanding racial disparities in cardiovascular medicine, as well as in outcomes in atrial fibrillation and sinus node dysfunction. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jackson. Thank you, Uptil, for the introduction. Um, also want to thank my mentor, Dr. Kevin Thomas, who is conveniently absent currently, um, <laughs> who, who put me up to this, but thank him for providing me this opportunity to speak here. Um, what I would like to do over the next 30 minutes or so is talk about an active area of research, um, not only for myself, but many of the faculty here at the DCRI, specifically the cardiology faculty. And that's a discussion about the epidemiology, the outcomes, and the treatment of atrial fibrillation in underrepresented minorities. Um, as we go through the talk, you'll see that many of the references are from primary authors here at the DCRI. And, and I think that speaks to the enthusiasm and the commitment of these investigators in tackling racial disparities in cardiovascular medicine as um, an issue in terms of a quality control issue. So I currently have no disclosures, but hopefully there'll be many more uh, to come down the road. So at the end of the talk, I hope you have an understanding about the incidence and prevalence of atrial fibrillation in underrepresented minorities. I hope that you can eloquently talk about the outcomes by race and ethnicity with respect to atrial fibrillation that you will understand the differences in the quality of anticoagulation bet between different racial and ethnic groups, and that you can describe the benefits of non-vitamin K oral anticoagulants and the generalizability of data from randomized clinical trials and how, how that applies to specific races and ethnic groups. So when we talk about atrial fibrillation, we really should talk about it in the context of a global epidemic. So this article, which was published in 2014 in circulation by Samit Chu and colleagues, and what they did was they systematically reviewed atrial fibrillation population studies from 1980 through 2010. And what they were able to do was they were able to highlight that there's a geographic variation in the incidence and prevalence of atrial fibrillation. So when you look at this map, which is broken down into 21 global burden of disease regions, you see that atrial fibrillation is a disease of the developed or developing nations of, this, of the world. So after reviewing over 300 manuscripts, this group was able to estimate that in 2010, there were approximately 35 million individuals globally with atrial fibrillation approximately 22 million men and around 12 to 13 million women. In addition, we, what you see when you look at the map is that for areas like North America, there's a very high prevalence of atrial fibrillation, some 700 to 775 prevalent cases of AFib per 100,000 persons. If you compare that to an area like Japan, where there's 250 to 325 prevalent AFib or A flutter cases in that region. So when we talk about atrial fibrillation, we should speak about the epidemiology. Atrial fibrillation is the most common sustained arrhythmia, not only in the United States, but globally. 
And with that comes an increased risk of heart failure, threefold, stroke, fivefold, and an increase in mortality as well as morbidity. There's greater than six million individuals currently in the United States with atrial fibrillation, and that number is expected to double by the year 2050. Atrial fibrillation is the disease predominantly of men. It's a disease predominantly of the elderly. And one in four individuals over the age of 40 will unfortunately develop atrial fibrillation. So we, when we look at the expenditures related to this arrhythmia, we can see that in 2005, there was over $6 billion allocated toward the treatment of atrial fibrillation. So the figure on the right, which is somewhat intuitive, shows that if you did not have atrial fibrillation, clearly your health care expenditures were much less than if you did have atrial fibrillation. Now this data is from 2005. There's more current estimates that suggest that Medicare spent in excess of $16 billion in 2008 caring for patients with atrial fibrillation. So you can see the broad economic impact that this disease process will have on our healthcare system. So atrial fibrillation is not only associated with significant morbidity, but it's also associated with increased mortality. This is an article published in circulation by Benjamin and colleagues from the Framingham study, and they specifically looked at accumulative mortality in patients aged 55 through 74 and stratified them by gender and AF status. And what you can see is that irrespective of gender, if you had AFib, you had a higher mortality. So to summarize, when you look at the consequences of atrial fibrillation, there's certainly an increased risk of thromboembolic disease, which we will speak to at length, but there's increased risk of hospitalizations, there's reduced quality of life, presumably due to symptoms, there's impaired hemodynamics, which certainly fuels worsening symptoms, which increases hospitalizations, and there's increased mortality. So we've touched on some epidemiology of AFib in general. We spoke to the morbidity and mortality. Let's talk about the incidence and prevalence of AFib among underrepresented minorities. So the incidence of AF in Cauc Caucasians and African Americans has been analyzed in the atherosclerosis risk and community study. So ERIC is a population-based prospective cardiovascular study of a large cohort of patients, over 15,000. Patients at the time of enrollment were aged 45 through 64, and they were sampled from four specific communities, Minneapolis, Minnesota, and Washington County, Maryland, which were the Caucasian cohorts, and then Forsyth County, North Carolina, and Jackson, Mississippi, which were the Af African-American cohorts. Atrial fibrillation was captured via electrocardiogram at baseline and three follow-up visits, as well as hospitalizations and death. And so when we look at the results, we see that despite an increased number of risk factors associated with atrial fibrillation, blacks tended to have less incident atrial fibrillation than whites. For example, in Forsyth County, there were 5.2 incident AF cases for whites per 1,000 person years compared to 2.8 for blacks. And after adjustment for a number of covariates, you see that blacks had a 41% lower risk of developing atrial fibrillation than whites. So if you look at the figure on the right, it simply shows you that atrial fibrillation, as we age, the risk goes up for everyone, irrespective of race but that incidence is lower for black populations. This data is from a cross-sectional study from Shin and colleagues published in 2010, and it's from over 400,000 members of the Kaiser Permanente Southern California Health Membership Plan in 2008. And what you can see is that the prevalence for black individuals, both male and female, was about half of that compared to white individuals. 
And after adjustment, you can see that the risk of developing atrial fibrillation was about half of that for blacks, about 40% less for Hispanics, and about a third less for Asian populations. Even more data, this time is courtesy of Dr. Kevin Thomas, published in JAHA in 2013, where he analyzed over 135,000 hospitalizations from 2006 through 2012, and over 275 hospitals participating in the AHA Get With the Guidelines Heart Failure Program, in which you can see that after adjustment and accounting for age, that at, at, at every age group, that blacks were less likely to have atrial fibrillation than whites, and it was statistically significant at each age group. That's conditional on having heart failure? Correct, this was a heart failure population, concomitant with atrial fibrillation. So not to beat a dead horse, but there are numerous studies that have shown what we've just talked about, that blacks have less atrial fibrillation compared to whites. Atria, EPOC, the Medic medical care survey, hospital discharge survey, all show similar results. But we have a problem. And more specifically, we have a paradox that remains to this date difficult to explain in that despite having more risk factors for atrial fibrillation, including hypertension, hyperlipidemia, tobacco use, increased body mass index, blacks have less incident and prevalent atrial fibrillation than whites. So further evaluation of the differences in risk factors is highlighted in this analysis. So this study was published in 2010 by Marcus and colleagues, and what they did was they compared the baseline characteristics between blacks and whites in two cohorts. The ERIC cohort, which we have already spoke about, and then the cardiovascular health study cohort. The cardiovascular health study cohort enrolled more than 5,000 individuals aged greater than 65, and they randomly sampled them from Medicare beneficiary, beneficiary lists from four communities, Washington County, Maryland, Sacramento County, California, which represented the Caucasian cohort, Forsyth, North Carolina, and then Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, which represented the African-American cohort. And what you can see is across both cohorts, there's an increase in risk factors associated with atrial fibrillation for blacks compared to whites. And these are statistically significant. So how do we explain this paradox in that blacks have less incident and prevalent atrial fibrillation, but that they have more risk factors associated with the development of that disease? Is it an increase in mortality in blacks at a younger age? Well, that seems difficult to sort of reason in that you would be surmising that whites would have a survival bias and that there would appear to be more AFib in whites and blacks. But I think that explanation alone is of lower likelihood given that there's such a large difference in the magnitude of prevalent AFib for African Americans compared to Caucasians. Is there differential under ascertainment of AF in blacks? We know that blacks are an underrepresented group we know that they lack resources and may not come to medical attention compared to whites. We understand also that blacks have a history of more likely having paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. This is atrial fibrillation that can come and go, so we may not, from two ends, be capturing their AFib, and they may not be just be coming to medical attention. Is there a differential impact on AF risk factors in blacks? Are there genetic variants present in whites, but not in blacks, that made whites more prone to atrial fibrillation? Or conversely, are there genetic variants in blacks that protect them against atrial fibrillation? Is it any of these explanations? Maybe it's none. You know, I would like to think that it's probably some combination or some multifactorial process, and I think the genetic variant sort of theory is very novel and very provocative, but clearly at this stage it's unproven. 
When we look further, we can associate another risk factor with the development of atrial fibrillation for black individuals, and that's European ancestry. So once again, this study published by Marcus and colleagues, circulation in 2010, and they were able to demonstrate from two cohorts, the ERIC cohort and the cardiovascular health study, as well as, as, well as a pooled analysis from both data sets, that each 10% increase in European ancestry, as determined by a fancy genetic array that has been previously validated and after adjustment, was associated with an 18% increase in incident AF. So quote unquote, your dose of European ancestry was a risk for the development of atrial fibrillation. So we spoke about the epidemiology, we talked a little bit about morbidity and mortality, we talked about the sort of the differential incidence and prevalence of atrial fibrillation with respect to blacks and whites. And before we transition into outcomes, let's speak a little bit about just generalities regarding stroke. So we all know that strokes are bad. There's a stroke every 40 seconds in the United States. Strokes are the third leading cause of death in this country. Over 140,000 deaths annually can be attributed to stroke. Strokes cause serious long-term disability and obviously are a significant health and economic burden to our healthcare system. Almost 75% of the strokes occur over the age of 65, and hypertension is the most important and modifiable risk factor associated with stroke. Now, not surprisingly, there's a differential stroke rate by race and ethnicity. So the Northern Manhattan Stroke Study is a population-based prospective incidence and case control study, and it was designed to determine risk factors in the incidence of stroke in a multi-ethnic population. And what we see is that blacks and Hispanics compared to whites had a two-fold or higher greater incidence of all types of stroke when compared to white populations. We also see an increased incidence of hemorrhagic stroke with Hispanic men having a threefold higher incidence than white men and black women having greater than a threefold incidence higher than white women. Now, even with this being said, contemporary studies have really struggled to determine what's the specific etiology of stroke in these populations. Is it all atrial fibrillation? Is it some you know, other venothromboembolic process? But we do know that a conservative estimate of that strokes in the United States atrial fibrillation is the cause of 15% of them. So as we move on to outcomes, we should revisit the ERIC study. And what we see is that they use AF, AF to predict mortality as well as other hard cardiovascular outcomes such as stroke and other CV outcomes. And what we see is that African Americans with atrial fibrillation have a higher cumulative incidence, incidence of stroke compared to white populations with, Af with atrial fibrillation. And even when you remove atrial fibrillation from the picture, and as stated in other data, you see that black populations still have a higher incidence of stroke <coughs> compared to white populations. So this data is from Michael Kim and colleagues, and it was an abstract presentation at the QCOR conference in 2013. And what Kim and his colleagues did was, was perform a comparative effective analysis of warfarin among AF Medicare beneficiaries. And what they were able to show was that white patients, excuse me, black patients when compared to white patients were 40% 40, 40 more likely to have a stroke even after adjustment for warfarin use with a significant p-value. In addition, they saw a significant reduction in the mortality with the use of warfarin for all comers greater than 70% with a significant p-value, but that black patients had a 25% higher mortality risk than white patients even after adjusting for warfarin. Additional outcomes were that five-year survival for all AF beneficiaries was about 
that Asians had better CV outcomes than other, under, other underrepresented minorities, and that women had a lower death rate than men, but slightly higher stroke and hospitalization rates. This is data from the race and ethnicity analysis in the Orbit AF registry. And this data will be um, submitted as an abstract of the American College of Cardiology sessions for 2014, 2015. But in terms of outcomes, we saw comparing blacks, Hispanics, and whites, no difference in all cause mortality, no differences in new onset heart failure, first event for stroke or TIA. In addition, we saw no differences in all cause hospitalization or cardiovascular hospitalization. There was lower anticoagulation rates for blacks compared to both Hispanic and white populations. And then the comparison of these outcomes really must be taken into context given the low power of underrepresented minorities in orbit, which really comprise about 5% of the overall orbit registry, which is over 10,000 patients. So our discussion of stroke really can't be complete without discussing stroke in the context of AF morbidity and warfarin utilization. We know that non-valvular AF is associated with a five-fold increased risk of stroke. We know that valvular AF is associated with a 17-fold increased risk of stroke. We know that at least 15% of strokes in the U.S. are due to atrial fibrillation. We know that greater than 36% of strokes in individuals of elderly age are due to atrial fibrillation. We know that both in the United States and Canada, there is a large number of preventable strokes. And we all know that anticoagulation can reduce the, roke, excuse me, the risk of stroke and systemic embolism. So how well are we doing in terms of using anticoagulation to prevent that risk? Well, this paper was published by Dr. Piccini and colleagues, colleagues in 2010, and what we see from many regist registries and databases, get with the guidelines, Medicare, NRAF, and Atria, is that our utilization of warfarin is suboptimal and then sometimes it's even quite poor. Now, this is a study, once again, done by Dr. Thomas, looking at atrial fibrillation and heart failure cohort, and what we see are two things. Number one, that blacks at the time of discharge were less likely to have warfarin prescribed than whites. In addition, we see a risk treatment paradox in that as the CHADS score increase, which signifies an increase in risk of stroke, we really see no differences in the utilization of warfarin at discharge for both groups. So we've talked about incidence and prevalence. We've talked about atrial fibrillation in terms of its epidemiology, morbidity, mortality. We spoke a little bit to outcomes and race and ethnicity for AF. Let's talk about the quality of anticoagulation by race and ethnicity. So this study was published by Shin and colleagues in 2007, published in JAK. And their design of their study was to look at the risk of intracranial hemorrhage by race and ethnicity among patients with AF who were treated with warfarin. So what they found was that Asians had a 15-fold higher risk of intracranial hemorrhage, and this is unadjusted data. You see that blacks have a risk of around 4.9, and then Hispanics have a risk, increased risk of around 4.8. When you look at the adjusted data, you see that in compared to Caucasians, Asians had an increased risk of intracranial hemorrhage fourfold, black and Hispanic twofold when compared to Caucasians. When you look at the anticoagulation intensity at the time of intracranial hemorrhage, you can see that there was no statistically significant difference between groups and the proportion of patients with intracranial hemorrhage for INR values greater than three and greater than four. You do see a statistically significant difference in that minorities had higher INR values greater than 
for those inter individuals with intra intracranial hemorrhage. So we've described incidence and prevalence. We've talked about outcomes. We've described the quality of anticoagulation. Now let's discuss the benefits of non-vitamin K oral anticoagulants and really the generalizability of the data surrounding um, those trials and how they apply to race and ethnicity. So we all know these agents. The bigotran is a direct thrombin inhibitor, Xeralto and Apixaban are factor 10A inhibitors. And the benefit of these drugs are number one, that they're oral agents. Number two, they do not require any laboratory monitoring. Number three, they approve, approve for reducing stroke and systemic embolism and non-valvular AF. Number four, they are non-inferior or superior to the standard of care, which is warfarin. They have favorable drug interactions. They can be administered at regular intervals at a consistent dose, and they have rapid peak anticoagulation. So these same benefits are are also reasons why these drugs would be preferentially used with success in underrepresented minority populations. These populations are more than likely to live in communities with lower socioeconomic status and are less likely to have the know-how to maintain warfarin, its laboratory monitoring, in a safe and sort of efficacious manner. So, the ease of administration and patient convenience would speak to increased compliance. The lack of monitoring also would be a significant plus. And the main benefit here is reduction in intracranial hemorrhage. So is there data that shows that there's significant reductions in intracranial hemorrhage using one of the non-vitamin K oral anticoagulants by race and ethnicity? And it turns out that there is. This study published in Stroke, written by Hanke et al., and I think you would recognize many of the co-authors here, but what they did was they investigated the rates, the outcomes, and the predictors of intracranial hemorrhage from the Rocket AF study. And what we see is that race, specifically Asian and blacks, was an independent and significantly, significant predictor associated with intracranial hemorrhage. What we also see is for those patients randomized to warfarin, there was a 40% less risk of intracranial hemorrhage compared to treatment with warfarin. Ori and colleagues performed a similar analysis comparing dabigatran versus warfarin with respect to bleeding outcomes in Asian and non-Asian groups. What we see is that for warfarin, in hemorrhagic stroke, Asians had a higher event rate compared to non-Asians. And then when we use treatment with dabigatran, both the risk and subsequently the event rates decreased. Looking at intracranial hemorrhage, once again, we see that Asians had a higher event rate compared to non-Asians. And the treatment with dabigatran decreased the overall risk and subsequently the event rates. So despite these benefits and novel oral anticoagulant agents, do we know how safe they are among underrepresented groups? This is data that's soon to be published, but it shows the enrollment by race in three large randomized trials that demonstrated either non-inferiority or superior, superiority when compared to warfarin in preventing stroke and systemic embolism. And what we can see is if we total the population, there's over 15,000 participants, excuse me, 50,000 participants from the RELY, the ROCKET, and the Aristotle trial. And what you can see is for Hispanics, they represent 10%, only 10% of that total 50,000, and then there's, and there's also incomplete reporting. What's even more sort of alarming is that Blacks represent less than 1.5% of that overall trial population of over 50,000 patients in those three trials. So this begs the question, do we really know how safe and efficacious these drugs are in these populations if they're not being studied? So there are guidelines that, are, that address the reporting of race and ethnicity, published in 2003 by Kaplan and colleagues. 
and to go through them briefly, your reasons for wanting to know race and ethnicity data should be specified. I think it would be misleading to just have race and ethnicity data in every study in the, in the sense that you would be sort of putting other determinants of disease, such as environmental factors and other social determinants, um, sort of on equal par or less par than race, meaning that race and ethnicity, there should be a specific focus as to why you're analyzing that in a specific paper. In addition, patients should be, there should be clear explanation to how, as to how, how patients assign themselves their race and ethnicity. What we may su assume somebody's race and ethnicity to be may be very different in terms of how they self-report their own race and ethnicity. Race and ethnicity should never really be used as a proxy for genetic variation. I think certainly it, it's, it's a reasonable assumption to assume that there are differences on the genetic level, but without hard, firm gene studies that have been vetted, it's really an assumption that should not be made. And the other bullets speak to the point that although race and ethnicity is certainly a factor, we cannot ignore social determinants, um, changes in environmental status, behavioral context, and other issues. In addition, there is the Food and Drug Administration Act, Section 801, which expands the reporting and the scope of clinical trials. This is responsible for the formation of clinicaltrials.gov and really recommends that race and ethnicity, where specified and where there's a disparity in healthcare, be reported in publication. So conclusion, AF is a, it's a significant public health concern associated with the high morbidity high mortality and significant economic burden. Strokes are preventable if patients are risk stratified and treated appropriately. Racial and ethnic subpopulations, despite having a lower prevalence, are at a unique risk for out adverse outcomes. And then non-vitamin K oral agents appear safe. They're an efficacious. However, for populations at the most increased risk for intracranial hemorrhage, who stand to benefit from NOACs have been the least tested in randomized clinical trial data. In terms of future directions, I think the FDA as a regulatory agency has a huge role in making sure that therapeutics are both safe, efficacious, and generalizable to all groups. I think journals, specifically large journals like the New England Journal of Medicine, um, you know, when there is a disparity in health care, it benefits everybody to report race and ethnicity data. I think if large scale journals do it, this will trickle down to small, smaller scale journals, we have more information. I think funding, specifically from industry and from the government, should sort of be channeled to those studies where racial disparities are being addressed. And also the NIH Revitalization Act, which has been around really for about 20 years, um, there should be more sort of attention paid to enforcing this mandate when reporting race and ethnicity for racial disparities. So some questions to sort of think about as we conclude, should we conduct race-specific trials only in specific subgroups? When we're constructing trials, what is the adequate representation of a racial or ethnic specific group? Do we base that on the prevalence of the disease of interest in that group? Do we base that on the world demographics? Do we know? And how do we, in a broad sense, increase <coughs> racial representation in clinical trials? Thank you. Great, thanks for that uh, wonderful presentation. Um, any questions, folks? Want to? I mean, I think there's proposed a number of really interesting questions and important ones when we consider uh, mixed epidemiology and, and outcomes, as well as um, in the setting of clinical trials. Um, just open it up for, for comment. I... <clears throat> Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Larry, that was great. Um, and a very nice review of an important area. Um, 
we struggle with this concept of race a lot when we're trying to do research and figure out what to do and how to do it. And uh, on the one hand, we feel pretty comfortable in saying that race is not, as you said, not a biological, not a genetic variable. And a lot of it may be a surrogate for other things like socioeconomic status. Um, but yet, we don't really do much creative work and kind of figure out how to capture socioeconomic status if that's what we believe. Um, what should we what should we measure? Do we know how to do this? And and yet we also get, you know, at the same time people start talking about. Uh, I think we're we're not quite decided what we think about this whole mix and how to untangle it, but it seems like we need to have some kind of conceptual step forward if we're going to make any progress on what to do, how to go beyond sort of descriptive work to intervention work. We need to isolate where the active modifiable stuff. I, I, I agree, so, and I think it's difficult because you know, how many sort of social determinants or environmental factors can you adjust for, correct for, to sort of tease out these differences? Um, unfortunately, I don't, I don't have a, a good answer um, to your question. I think we all re recognize that, you know, these issues have been described to the T by yourself, Adrian Hernandez, Eric Peterson. I think the next step clearly would be to sort of isolate why these differences are occurring. Um, a way forward, I'm not sure. I'm interested to know what others in the audience may think. We just, I mean, it seems like we could do more exploratory work to try to figure out these interrelationships, but, uh, you know, and, and uh, maybe that's an area of research or collaboration with social scientists that we should figure out how to describe it. And it's not necessarily in our skill set. <coughs> figure out all the stuff that's important about socioeconomic status. And maybe there's a lot of stuff we wouldn't want to get involved with because it gets into a whole other disciplines stuff that we don't want to know that much about. But there's probably something that we could take from them that would get us to at least a, another level of resolution from education, which is usually the only step. measure that we ever collect. Or we've tried to do income too, which is tough because people, when your healthcare team is asking you how much money you make, people are a little suspicious that that might have, that might come back to bite them somehow. So you never know whether you're getting good information. How about zip code? Yeah, some creative stuff is being done with zip code now, uh, but sure. you know, you, I don't know how well that works yet. I haven't seen enough work with it. Zip code's too coarse of a measure. Census uh, tracts are better. Because it's basically census oriented. Zip code in and of itself as a unit is too too large. I might push back a little bit and say, not that I don't agree that this is important, but from a CMS perspective, they are saying, who cares? Because they're basically saying, is, you know, if you're going to, as they're assessing quality across institutions, they're making a stand and saying race should not be considered a factor uh, in risk modeling. Mm -hmm. um, well, they're one of the few people who are saying that because all the other regulatory bodies are going the other way. I'm sure they're, I mean, I'm certainly one of the yeah. ones who are against, who's against <laughs> that particular stance. Right, right. And they've met a lot of, um, you know, uh, but I mean, this is, you know, performance measures and pay for performance moving is forward is different. not involving race as a factor, period. But they're not trying to solve the question of why do we have disparities in this country. Right. Or why the life expectancy is drastically different between, you know, black males and white females. There's a 15-year gap that exists there that is, you know, you can argue about what it's due to, but the fact is it is what it is, that they are what they are. And so to understand why that, that difference exists is very important. And it's incredibly complicated, right? It's not easy. This is hard work, which is why nobody really wants to do it. Um, but the reality is, is that we know that there are a few polymorphisms that are different. There's no doubt about that. I think the Bible story and all of its provocative nature and controversy is a very interesting thought from a biological basis, how nitric oxide deficiency can manifest itself as a phenotype 
that is largely a social construct, which is race. It's very interesting and provocative. And that's probably why the uptake isn't very good uh, for class one indicated therapy. And so I think we've got to figure out how to study. It's, it's difficult, it's hard. It's hard to disentangle, um, Dan, as you mentioned, the socioeconomic aspect, but there are a myriad of studies out there that say adjusting for all of those things, it's not just poor people are black and therefore there's, that's why the difference exists. It's not uh, just right. that. No, we need, right. we need much more sophisticated measures of what what these constructs represent. So I'm not going to give up on the zip code. How about... Uh, <laughs> I, had some, I was at Kiowa last weekend. I had somebody who had a Short iPhone. Of poverty zip code. <laughs> <laughs> and they looked at a... And with their iPhone, they could tell me the price of the house that we were next to. How about... Zillow, yeah. <laughs> Zillow, that's what it was. Yeah. That's Zillow. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah, you're so <laughs> <laughs> uh, just like, I learned about you. I looked you, up your house. You were <laughs> there. <laughs> uh, the barn or the house? <laughs> Chicken coop. Uh, uh, but, but, but with the address, maybe we can get much more granular. With the actual address, I think, uh, I think one could do it. Another analysis that I thought was Tom fascinating, and Larry, I wonder if you know of any more like this. It was, I think I was looking at MI outcomes in, in, in uh, I think it was like either African descent or Caribbean descent blacks in the United Kingdom versus in the U.S. And it was a way to try to sort out some of the um, racial, economic, and regional, because there's all these complex interactions. Right? Environment. I thought it was very interesting. Now, there, uh, granted, there are fewer African descent uh, uh, in the in the population in most of other um, Western, um, you know, European countries, for example, but it still is a potential tool, I think. Well, there, you know, there have been studies looking at hypertension in Sub-Saharan Africa compared with those in the U.S., like mass cohorts, and it's interesting because obviously the lifestyles are very different. Socioeconomic statuses, you know, are universally obviously um, a lot of disenfranchised folks in Sub-Saharan Africa. But yet hypertension, the prevalence and the outcomes, you know, seem much worse in that population, which again, the same thing that we see here in the U.S. is reflected in Africa. And there seems to be something that makes it fundamentally a different course of disease um, than, than in majority population. So again, I think with the human genome, genome projects, we're going to get closer to the few genetic explanations, but currently how the genetic underpinnings you know, go with the socioeconomic determinants is very difficult. Um, but there, you know, to your point, I think there's some things that we can try to understand is like, why do fundamentally, do, does one group systematically prefer less intervention than the other, right? That's something easily studyable, easily intervenable upon. Is it the fact that they have this huge mistrust that I think we believe is there? Is it that, you know, there's generations of not wanting to go to medical <coughs> care? So, and how do we change that thinking to understand that in a lot of respects, medicine is a good thing and that there's therapies that are being refused that are available that could potentially change outcomes. So I think there are some things that we can tangibly address. There's a lot of things that we can't. I can't address who has insurance and who doesn't. Certainly that's a driver, but beyond those things, there are things that I think systematically can be addressed. So just to add to that, that's a great point. Um, wonder if you've thought about the role of PCORI in the movement of including patients in study designs. Do you think um, for problems like this, that may help engage patients to be part of trials? That's certainly one of the hopes of PCORI. Um, and would that help us get some better information that we can use to like, understand the reasons for variation in practices, but also then the impact of therapies? Any thoughts on PCORI? That's a great point. Tom and I, our sort of ICD project, have talked about you know bringing um, patients and move in terms of the decision making process and sort of what is their education, what is their understanding regarding that. So I think you know patients, patient centered sort of interest and feedback is is vitally important. Um, I think your uh, your approach is, is feasible. I mean, you, can, you can really uh, identify uh, what is called a sp special populations. You know, uh, there are at least two 
uh, ways. One is uh, by a self-reporting definition uh, that is used by the census data. Uh, they usually have 10 or 12 categories and then uh, they ask uh, which one do you belong to? And the second is that is regularly used is the by surnames. Also, the census use surnames, uh, for instance, in, uh, in the state of uh, Florida or Texas, for Latino, Hispanic uh, populations, they generate uh, an algorithm. And it's very, very close to what is the real world of a census uh, data. Uh, it may be a problem. It may be easy because it, I've, I've done it in, in the southern part of Chile with Mapuche indigenous populations. They have surnames, and also the census have a way they address to them, well, which uh, tribe or which one you belong to. And I've run the the, the observations, surnames, and uh, and uh, self-reporting uh, ethnicity. And they both really get really close. So if you measure in one dimension, you get pretty much the same results regardless. If you had like a, like a 45 degree line, you can use, for instance, the, the Gini coefficient and see the percentage of, of population by surname. And the other one is percentage of self-reported. The observations would go really close to the 45 degree line. So there's a way to, to handle those, uh, those uh, things, you know. Uh, and it really does. I mean, uh, race and ethnicity, it really is uh, a predictor of uh, health inequalities. Um, I did that with hospital discharge records and mortality records in the southern part of Chile. And using both, uh, both uh, criteria, census and uh, 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 surname, and compare the relative risk of uh, certain health outcomes like respiratory infections, and compared by, by age and, and adjusted by, and it really does. I mean, you find that there are uh, tremendous inequalities of, of health and dying, of course. Uh, and then you can adjust those estimates by different sizes of the geography. You know, some live far away, they have different distributions geographically. And then, but you can plug into the, the model a way to adjust by the size of the population or by the distance each subgroup has with respect to a, to a center. You see? So you get a very good estimate. Uh, How do you think about doing that in the US? Oh, it could be done. Just uh, I did the only my only concern here is really the, uh, the 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 type of people like to be anonymous here and privacy and all those things are. But today I was uh, reading uh, on geographical records that are, were georeferenced by uh, D D D H N. Yeah, by do, and they are like four point three million records that had been georeferenced uh, on several uh, uh, conditions and, and antibiotics, you know, some that are resistant, uh, some, some antibiotics. That's what they wanted to measure. But those it's those very those feasible. Great ideas for infectious diseases and those sorts of right. things where location in space may be very important. And certainly, neighborhoods have certain characteristics that absolutely their environments can influence health. Um, but I, I, I wonder for chronic diseases if that's going to get us to sort of every right. patient, especially for rare conditions. I was struck by how rare, relatively rare this is in African Americans, yet their outcomes are so dramatically different, especially if you consider comparisons to Asians. Has there been good studies comparing Africans, African descent to Asians in terms of the biology to try to understand the differences in outcomes? I know. Uh, one thing that struck me in in Larry's presentation was this IPC analysis that 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 may get at what the nuances of you know race is a rather and ethnicity are rather crude markers 
uh, but that may get at more of the nuance of, of what the genetic um, background really is for, for folks. Any party thoughts? Kevin? Yeah, I mean, I think that was a nice job and I think sparked a lot of good discussion, which I think is what we're here to talk about. I think the, the inclusion of minorities in clinical trials, you know, I, I think certainly is at the forefront of a lot of folks' agendas from a regulatory standpoint, the FDA, the NIH, NHLBI. Um, and, you know, it was kind of striking, obviously, doing work in this field to see a therapy that was so novel and important to see the generosity and representation to be so poor. So I think we all continue to struggle with this whole issue of representation in clinical trials. That's what we do to a large extent here at the DCRI. And so, you know, I think it was striking to see that and there's a huge opportunity um, to try to change that going forward. Right, thanks. And hopefully by raising awareness through seminars like this and the work that you guys are doing, we can also engage in conversations about process and plan for those sorts of uh, important Thanks again, Dr. Jackson, for your presentation.